Good morning and good evening. I'm Jennifer Kaiser from the University of Colorado and on behalf of the organizing committee, I'd like to welcome you uh, to the 21st International Workshop on the Clinical Pharmacology of HIV, Hepatitis and Other Viruses and our first virtual edition. Uh, last year's conference in Nordvik feels like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? Um, it's bittersweet to see so many familiar names but not be able to see your faces. Uh, we do have about 150 participants this year, which is similar to years past. So I'm glad so many of you were able to join us. Um, can, although there won't be lost luggage or jet lag this year, we're also going to miss our hallway chats and cocktail hours and hugs. Um, I hope you're all safe and well during these challenging times. And I'm grateful that we still have this opportunity to share our research and to connect as a pharmacology community. It's clear that our research is needed now more than ever. So over the next three days, we will have nine plenaries, eight oral abstracts, and 17 poster presentations, as well as virtual coffee breaks and electronic poster viewing. Victoria, our virtual conference host from Virology Education, will assist with keeping us on time and navigating the own air software to optimize our virtual meeting experience. So our objectives for the conference as a whole are to gather experts involved in clinical pharmacology from different disciplines in an interactive workshop setting, to provide a platform for presentation and discussion of the latest developments in the field, to share information on ongoing pharmacologic studies, and to translate new data to treatment guidelines as well as stimulating discussion and consensus on best practices. And this slide shows our specific learning objectives. CME is offered through the European Accreditation Council for continuing medical education for this workshop. And our workshop is endorsed by the following. We would like to sincerely thank our corporate sponsors. So our first workshop session this morning is focused for this evening, is focused on emerging infections and COVID-19. We have four presenters in this session, and we will have a live Q&A with the presenters during the discussion portion of this session. Please type any questions that you have in the Q&A, and we will have time to address these questions during the live discussion session with all of our speakers after Dr. Strubel's presentation. And our schedule is shown on this slide for the next three days. I will now turn it over to my co-chair for this meeting and my co-moderator for this session, Dr. Kimberly Scarzi from the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Dr. Scarzi will introduce our first two speakers. Dr. Scarzi. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Um, it seems only fitting that we start off this year's conference with a presentation from a true world expert in both pharmacology and the challenges that are presented by emerging infections. I'm pleased to present Dr. Mohamed Lamord. He's the head of global health security at the Infectious Diseases Institute, uh, Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda. For well over a decade, Dr. Lamord's work has focused on developing uh, capacity for clinical pharmacology that's relevant to global health, as well as enhancing HIV care and treatment and strengthening the medical system uh, to detect and manage disease outbreaks in Uganda. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Lamord in his talk entitled Emerging Infections and Biosecurity. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present on emerging infections and biosecurity. These are my disclosures. So the global health security agenda is really an effort from countries um, to prevent, detect, and respond uh, to avoidable epidemics and other biologic threats. Regarding um, biologic threats, this could be everything from outbreaks to formal acts of bioterrorism. However, what we know is that most countries are not prepared. In fact, just prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, the Global Health Security Index conducted by Johns Hopkins University showed that countries on average were about 40% prepared for a future pandemic. 
And some of these diseases are quite dangerous. The WHO lists priority diseases that could result in a pandemic. But unfortunately for many of these diseases, um, there is no therapeutic. No licensed countermeasures exist for diseases like CCHF, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, Ebola, Marburg, Lassa. And you can even see that some of the other diseases that were considered in the 2018 um, revision included a highly pathogenic coronavirus disease other than MERS and SARS, which is the pandemic that we now face. And why is this important? It's because we all live in an interconnected world. Humans, domestic animals, wildlife, and the environment all carry pathogens, and we can exchange these pathogens and bring about diseases that are both known and unknown. And one of the big concerns we have right now is something called zoonotic spillover. Pathogens that primarily infect animals finally getting into the human population and causing large outbreaks. Now, Sub-Saharan Africa faces a lot of challenges when it comes to zoonotic spillover. It's rapidly developing in terms of economic growth. And so what we see is that a lot of encroachment into wildlife habitats is happening as urbanization or agriculture occurs. And at any point in time, there are multiple outbreaks that are monitored by the WHO Africa region that are ongoing. And we can see diseases that we thought were forgotten, like monkeypox coming back, diseases like Ebola still wrecking a toll, and other diseases um, like plague um, that we thought uh, we had a better control of. And fragile states and insecurity are one of the big challenges that we face. When you have fragile states and insecurity, it leads to economic displacement and it leads to physical displacement of people. And this could lead to overcrowding in refugee settlements and further fuel the spread of outbreaks. Western countries are very aware about the impact of rumors and myths on the potential to cause outbreaks and to actually hinder the control of outbreaks. And we've seen this in measles worldwide. In Africa, rumors around the polio vaccine caused a delay in controlling that outbreak uh, for more than 15 years. And we're seeing the same thing with COVID-19. In addition, we also have a situation where there are inadequate health workers to manage these threats. And even if you had a large outbreak, you may not have the required personnel in hospitals to manage critically ill patients. I'm giving an example of Uganda. In Uganda, in, between 2016 and 2018, we see many of these diseases that are on the priority list of WHO. And currently, Uganda is in Ebola preparedness because there's an 11th outbreak of Ebola in DRC. There's an ongoing outbreak of yellow fever in Uganda. We haven't got on top of the measles outbreak, and we're also trying to manage the COVID-19 outbreak. Managing this in health facilities where infection control is weak is a major challenge, and ensuring that some of our facilities strengthen IPC practices is one of the key aspects for disease control, not just for outbreaks, uh, but in routine settings. Now, countries cannot prepare without a plan. As I said earlier, well, 40% was the score worldwide. But for developed countries, that was as high as 50%. But for developing countries, preparedness for outbreaks was even less um, done. And for Uganda, we have to think about two main conditions, viral hemorrhagic fever syndromes like CCHF, Rift Valley fever, Marburg, and Ebola. And also, we also have to think about pandemic acute respiratory infections, such as pandemic influenza, COVID-19, and unknown respiratory pathogens. And this really applies to all countries. <laughs> 
typically outbreaks are the responsibility of government. And really, when you think about an individual trying to make a difference, it's often hard to see how that comes about. But one of the strategies we've been using is to think about institutions and how institutions can align with government to help to prevent outbreaks. Despite my clinical pharmacology training, I had the opportunity to work with WHO on infection prevention and control during the Ebola outbreak in 2015. On returning to my institute at Makere University in Uganda, we had to review our strategy and realize that these outbreaks could happen in our settings. And yet, as academic organizations, we didn't have a clear program to intervene or support governments where these outbreaks to occur. The Institute established a new program called the Global Health Security Department. And it broke down its efforts into laboratory biosafety biosecurity, really helping to detect threats earlier, and then field epidemiology that could support surveillance and investigation, and then treatment. Notably, we did not try to um, separate things out and focus only in one area, mainly because gaps in each of these areas could undermine efforts in the other areas. Here I'm going to talk about responding to viral hemorrhagic fevers in Uganda. In 2019, Uganda had a spillover of um, outbreaks um, from DRC resulting in four cases and four deaths. However, there were no transmission chains in Uganda. The 10th EVD outbreak in Democratic Republic of Congo was the second largest outbreak of EVD, and it occurred between 2018 and 2020. About 3,000 people were affected and 2,000 people died, despite the availability of vaccines uh, that were used to control the epidemic. However, this outbreak brought us important information because the first randomized controlled trial of therapeutics for Ebola was done in this, in this outbreak. The interim analysis at 681 patients showed that monoclonal antibodies, MAB114, and a Regeneron product, EB3, were superior to ZMAP. These drugs were also superior to a drug called remdesivir, which had been used um, and shown um, um, some kind of benefit um, for management of Ebola um, in terms of um, primates um, and preclinical studies um, had also suggested it would have benefit. And so it was surprising that it did not really perform well in this randomized controlled trial. For us in Uganda, it became necessary to prevent this spillover. And the approach that was used was to map out all the areas that would um, potentially have cases coming in from DRC. And this was done with a mapping process um, with the CDC country office um, called Population Connectivity Across Borders. Essentially, you do interviews and find out where people crossing from DRC into Uganda are most likely to go. And then you equip those hospitals and prepare surveillance sites in those areas, man border points to ensure that people who may have the disease that detected early, brought to a health facility and given treatment. But you also need to train healthcare workers on how to manage outbreaks for dangerous pathogens. The use of PPE or personal protective equipment like this is critical not just when they put them on, but more importantly, how they take them off. And drills are critical. Healthcare workers need to practice on an ongoing basis um, and learn how to use the tools that they have to ensure that they keep themselves safe. Here we see a cholera unit that was actually repurposed to support isolation for suspected patients with uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers and the drills that were performed to ensure that the staff could keep themselves safe. But platforms are emerging that will allow therapeutics, novel therapeutics to be tested. And here 
our institute works with um, the US Department of Defense to establish a trial site um, that allows us to implement medical countermeasures in a safe manner. It's highly equipped with an isolation lab, an isolation ward, and highly skilled personnel that perform drills weekly on infection prevention and control systems. Let's look at a second outbreak, and this is the one that we may all be more familiar with, which is COVID-19. Over 5,000 cases have been reported in Uganda and 60 deaths. Importantly, as, as much as two months ago, there were no deaths in Uganda. And this was due to aggressive control efforts right from the beginning. And Uganda had to put up quite a number of um, measures in place to manage COVID-19. As I said earlier, healthcare capacity was limited. In fact, prior to the outbreak, the publication reported only 55 intensive care unit beds, most of which, of course, were occupied. Our institute, um, working with the government, was able to provide staff um, to support the situation room, to participate in national task force events, but also to support government in drafting out laws that could help in control efforts uh, for COVID-19. In addition, um, we used a model that had been implemented for Ebola and expanded that nationwide, ensuring that every facility in the districts is reached and working with partners for HIV and other sectors to see that health facilities undergo mentorship to strengthen their infection prevention and control practices. Laboratory testing was critical for Uganda's response. Initially, much, much of the testing was done at points of entry to prevent the spread of um, COVID-19 from other countries into Uganda. And so Uganda fully landlocked, established over 27 sample collection sites at its borders, and then put out mobile testing labs so that the speed of testing could be increased um, for um, samples that were collected from its borders. We also supported surveillance at points of entry, but also cascading that to facilities and to communities, such that in every village in the zones that we covered, there would be someone in that village called a village health team member that knows what COVID-19 is and can report if people have unexplained symptoms or deaths. And here we come to medical countermeasures, which is the primary interest of the people in uh, attending this meeting. Um, the efforts that we put to control the outbreak bought time for Uganda, sufficient time for evidence to be released to show that a simple inexpensive steroid, dexamethasone, could be beneficial amongst patients with severe disease. And we were able to contribute to an Africa CDC statement that was then circulated to um, African states, including Uganda, to incorporate dexamethasone in their treatment guidelines. And that effort is ongoing. Convalescent plasma is something that has been used in the US and in Uganda too, it's still investigational. And here we have universities also contributing um, to that effort. I mentioned remdesivir earlier for Ebola and how it was shown to be unsuccessful. Um, notably, remdesivir seems to have um, a broader spectrum, spectrum when we look at it in vitro. Um, and remdesivir also showed potential benefit uh, for COVID-19 and was granted an uh, emergency use authorization in, in the U.S. also for patients that had more severe disease. Our team, in collaboration with the University of Turin, um, was able to support um, a bioanalytical protocol um, for looking at remdesivir concentrations in biological samples. And that is published in JAK this year. In addition, we're going to be looking at remdesivir and drug-drug interactions between remdesivir and commonly used antiretroviral drugs. Uh, because tenofovir, for example, seems to share similar phosphorylation pathways with remdesivir. And this will mean that we would have evidence that would be suitable in local settings for people with HIV and that may also develop COVID-19.
And so what have we learned? We know we can stop and slow down outbreaks if we act early and in a coordinated fashion, making sure that there are no gaps in the system for lab surveillance, infection control. And we also know that these outbreaks are certain. Well, we can avert disasters if we plan ahead. And access to therapeutics and vaccines are likely to remain a challenge worldwide um, because very little has been done for some of the diseases that we actually know can result in pandemics. So we need to act now for the known priority pathogens. I think we may have an excuse um, for not dealing with pathogens we don't know, but for those pathogens that we know, there is a an urgent call to accelerate um, investigational efforts to create new treatments for these diseases. So we do have a lot of supporters that help our work continue from CDC Foundation, USAMRID, Henry Jackson Foundation, the EDCTP, um, a very strong response partner resolved to save lives, as well as strong scientific and technical expertise uh, from the United States uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lamorde. Uh, next up, we are fortunate to be joined by Dr. Trip Gulick. Dr. Gulick is a professor in medicine and the chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Cornell Medicine. He's also an attending physician at New York Pres Presbyterian. We all know him well as his, for his expertise in HIV um, care, research, and treatment. Um, but he's also been on the front lines now for many months in the care of COVID-19 um, patients. Reflecting that, Dr. Gulick is the co-chair of both the D United States DHHS HIV treatment guidelines and now the US DHHS COVID-19 guidelines. We're fortunate to hear his perspectives today on, a, on current and emerging therapies for COVID-19. Dr. Gulick. Thank you. I'm pleased to speak about COVID-19 treatment. I have no disclosures. To understand COVID-19, we need to understand the clinical course of the disease and identify possible places for interventions. Someone acquires the virus at time zero and their viral load level of SARS-CoV-2 increases. Two to seven days later, they will develop symptoms and the viral load level reaches its highest levels at that point. Some patients will progress and SARS-CoV-2 will induce a cytokine storm with a profound inflammatory response, which can lead to respiratory failure and end organ disease over the course of five days. As ARDS occurs, some proportion of patients will progress and some will go on to death. So the approach to treating COVID-19 is to intervene at one or more portions of this clinical course. Antivirals, we know from other respiratory diseases, may have their best effect if used early on in the course of disease. Once the cytokine storm is brewing or has occurred, immunomodulators could dampen or interfere with that response. And then finally, when tissue damage of the lung or other end organs occurs, issues of tissue repair agents could help. So let's review these. It's fair to say there are no approved treatments for COVID-19 today, and our current standard of care is simply supportive, oxygen, antipyretics, et cetera. Interestingly, bacterial co-infections are initially rare. However, they may complicate a prolonged ICU stay. But there are many candidate treatments, antivirals, immunomodulators, antithrombotics, and cellular therapies. And I'd like to review some of these for you today. Let's go with antivirals. So to understand them, we need to understand the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2. Here's the virus over on the left with its spike protein, and here's the target cell with the ACE2 receptor sitting on the surface of the cell. And initially, this would be a respiratory epithelial cell. SARS-CoV-2 binds to the ACE2 receptor, and then a protease inhibitor acts to facilitate both attachment of the virus and fusion and endocytosis. 
the viral particle is then inside the cytoplasm, but uncoats, releasing its genetic material in the form of RNA, which is used for two purposes. One is it's transcribed to additional copies of viral RNA, and a second, it's translated to viral proteins. These components assemble within the cytoplasm, migrate to the surface of the cell, and then are released into the system and may bind to another cell that they may come in contact with infecting that cell. So the approach to antivirals has been to interfere with one or more steps of the life cycle of the virus. Entry inhibitors target that step early in the life cycle. Protease inhibitors target the translation and processing of viral proteins. RNA polymerase inhibitors interfere with transcribing. And uh, there are examples of all of these that have been tested. The antiviral agent with the best track record so far is an investigational antiviral called remdesivir. This is an RNA polymerase inhibitor that's an adenine derivative, so a nucleoside analog. It shows in vitro and animal data showing antiviral activity against SARS, MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID. This compound was around in the time of Ebola, and actually there was a large clinical trial of over 500 participants, so establishing a safety record for remdesivir. It's available only intravenously. There have been clinical trials now reported in COVID-19. Initially, a small study of compassionate use but the definitive study was sponsored by the US NIH called the ACT-1 study of over 1,000 people, and I'll share those results on the next slide. They were positive in severe COVID-19, and that led the US FDA to release remdesivir, an investigational agent, through a program called the Emergency Use Authorization. So here is the NIH study, the ACT Phase Three clinical study. It's multi-center randomized, double-blind, and placebo-controlled, so the highest quality of evidence. It enrolled over 1,000 adults hospitalized with COVID-19 with evidence of lower respiratory tract involvement, and they were randomized to receive remdesivir or a placebo. This was given intravenously over the course of 10 days. The study endpoint was time to clinical recovery, that is to discharge or ready for discharge. The graph shows the proportion of people in each group who recovered, and you can see more than 50% of all participants recovered, but more people in the remdesivir group shown in blue compared to the placebo group shown in orange, and this reached a high degree of statistical significance favoring remdesivir. Among the individual groups, the subgroup that did the best were those who were hospitalized and receiving oxygen. And you can see that the point estimate and the 95% confidence interval fall in the range favoring remdesivir in terms of clinical improvement. Notably, people who are mechanically ventilated or on ECMO, this did not, in this subgroup, reach statistical significance. Overall, they concluded that remdesivir is superior to placebo. There have been other studies of remdesivir reported one in severe COVID looked at just under 400 people who were randomized to different durations of remdesivir, five versus 10 days, and found no significant difference between those two lengths of therapy. And then in a similar study, people were enrolled with moderate COVID, which they defined as an oxygen saturation greater than 94%, but with documented pneumonia. They were randomized to either five or 10 days of remdesivir or the standard of care. And what did they find? Well, in terms of clinical improvement at day 11, the primary endpoint of the study, remdesivir with a duration of five days was statistically significantly superior to no remdesivir. And you can see that for you here. However, interestingly, the 10 day duration was not different than the standard of care, not significantly different. There were no new safety signals on the study, and overall they concluded that the clinical status benefit did occur in moderate COVID-19 
but questioned the clinical relevance. Remdesivir currently is intravenous, but subcutaneous and inhaled formulations are under study. And I received this from a colleague in India, generic remdesivir not now available in developing countries. But what about hydroxychloroquine? This is an FDA approved drug for the treatment of malaria and some autoimmune diseases, including lupus. Interestingly, it shows antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2 in vitro and has immunomodulatory effects. So this was a candidate compound early on for COVID-19. Well, what do we know? Early on, there were case reports, cohort studies, and small clinical trials, some of which showed benefit, but the data were conflicting, and they did see some potential for cardiac toxicity. There have been at least four large retrospective studies that found no benefit, two from New York State, one from the U.S. Veterans Administration, and a large global study of over 14,000 people. However, that study was later retracted, reminding us that COVID is going so fast that sometimes even published data may not be verified. The highest standard of care, though, would be randomized clinical trials, and we now have those for hydroxychloroquine. In this study from Brazil, over 600 hospitalized people with COVID were randomized to hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin versus standard of care, and the primary endpoint showed no difference in clinical outcomes at day 15 and more adverse events in the hydroxychloroquine group. Another study from the UK, which is the largest study yet done, randomized over 4,700 hospitalized patients with COVID to receive hydroxychloroquine or not. And the primary endpoint, no difference in 28-day mortality between the two groups. What about earlier stages? Could you use hydroxychloroquine in non-hospitalized patients? Well, a study from the US enrolled over 400 non-hospitalized patients with COVID to hydroxychloroquine or placebo and showed no difference in symptom severity or the risk of hospitalization. And finally, a study in Spain of non-hospitalized patients randomized them to hydroxychloroquine or no treatment and found no difference in terms of viral load reduction, hospitalization, or time to symptom resolution. Taken together, these suggest that there is no data to support using hydroxychloroquine in either hospitalized or non-hospitalized patients with COVID-19. What about the HIV protease inhibitors? Well, of course they're FDA approved. They do show activity against SARS-CoV-2 in the test tube. However, the pharmacokinetics of lopinavir riptonavir do not support its use for COVID-19. Why? because you need a hundred fold greater concentrations than you can achieve by taking the, swallowing the pills of lopinavir ritonavir to achieve inhibitory concentrations against SARS-CoV-2. There was one published randomized controlled study from China that enrolled just under 200 hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19, randomized them to lopinavir ritonavir or not, and they showed no difference in clinical endpoints of improvement, mortality, or detectable viral RNA. What about darunavir? Well, these, this is test tube data. Up top, we're looking at remdesivir, and you can see at concentrations that are achievable, you get 100% inhibition of SARS-CoV-2 in the test tube. Down below is darunavir, and you see no inhibition at all of SARS-CoV-2, even up to very high levels of darunavir. So the conclusion is that darunavir has no effect on SARS-CoV-2. There's an investigational agent called favipiravir, which is another RNA polymerase inhibitor. It has in vitro activity against a number of viruses, including SARS-CoV-2, and is approved in Japan for influenza. Some preliminary reports, both from China, suggest activity in COVID-19, these support moving forward with phase two studies of favipiravir, which are in progress around the world. What about antibody therapy? So the strategy of convalescent plasma is when you collect plasma from people who've recovered from an illness, 
and then administer it to people with the illness in hopes that the preformed antibodies will decrease the severity of the illness. This strategy has been used for over 100 years, and most recently, convalescent plasma was used in influenza, the original SARS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and even Ebola, and showed some advantages. There are potential risks of using convalescent plasma, including antibody-dependent enhancement of infection and allergic reactions. Well, what do we know? Randomized clinical trials, there's been three. The design was convalescent plasma versus the standard of care. A small study in China showed no clinical benefit, but they had to stop that study early because of the decreasing cases in China. There was another study randomized in the Netherlands. They too stopped early, could not demonstrate clinical benefit, but they noted that the patients that they enrolled had antibody levels that were similar to the convalescent plasma that they were going to administer, and they stopped their study. More recently, a randomized study was released from India in preprint form. Over 460 people randomized to convalescent plasma or not, and they showed no difference in severity of disease or mortality. While the clinical use has been reported in additional retrospective cohorts, but again, these can be subject to bias, we do have a large safety record from the United States through an expanded access program. A total of over 20,000 patients have been reported and they have shown very few, if any, side effects in this group. However, no conclusions about efficacy could be made because there was no control. Nevertheless, the US FDA authorized the release of convalescent plasma through the expanded use authorization with the uh, justification that it, quote, may be effective. They also caution that it does not represent a new standard of care and what we need are prospective randomized clinical trials to demonstrate efficacy and those are in progress right now. What about cytokine inhibitors? Can we interfere with the cytokine storm induced by SARS-CoV-2? Well, the best data we have in COVID-19 is for dexamethasone, the corticosteroid. This comes again from the large recovery study in the UK, where they've enrolled over 11,000 patients with COVID at 175 National Health Service hospitals. In this part of the study, over 6,400 people who were hospitalized with COVID-19 participated. They were randomized to receive dexamethasone, six milligrams a day for 10 days or until discharge versus the usual care. And you can see literally thousands of people in each group. The primary endpoint was 28 day mortality and you can see 23% on dexamethasone versus 26% who did not receive dexamethasone uh, ended up dying during the course of the study. This was a significant difference and the study was stopped early by the trial steering committee. The difference between the two is shown for you here. If you look at all participants, you can see that the benefit was a 17% reduction in mortality. How we, however, even greater benefits were seen in subsets of patients. So the sickest people who were mechanically ventilated or on ECMO experienced a 35% reduction in the risk of mortality with dexamethasone. And the group that received oxygen only experienced a 20% decrease in mortality. So overall, the investigators concluded dexamethasone is associated with a mortality benefit in patients requiring oxygen, and this has now become the standard of care. While other approaches have been specific immunomodulators, and interleukin-6 was a primary target. Ceruliumab is an interleukin-6 antagonist, and there were published retrospective cohort studies and case series that suggested benefit of using this compound. However, recently, and all we know is a press release, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase three study of ceruliumab showed no difference in clinical improvement uh, compared with the placebo arm. And a related compound, tocilizumab, also an IL-6 antagonist, again, cohort and case series suggested benefit, but 
Overall, the phase three study, which was placebo controlled, showed no difference in clinical improvement or mortality. So IL-6 antagonists not recommended in COVID. A number of other approaches are under exploration, interleukin-1 antagonists, BTK inhibitors, and JAK inhibitors. And recent suggestive data came from a phase three study of baricitinib in the presence of remdesivir, showing a modest benefit compared to remdesivir alone. Again, this is in the form of a press release, and we look forward to reviewing full data on that approach. Lastly, cellular therapies. If you have damage to the lungs or to distant end organs, can there be a benefit in trying novel approaches? So current studies are underway with mesenchymal stem cells, human vein umbilical cord cells, or natural killer T cells. And these are all currently under study. So what can we say in conclusion about the treatment of COVID-19 today in 2020? There are no current approved treatments for COVID-19. However, remdesivir has shown clinical benefit in hospitalized COVID patients on oxygen, but not intubated. And dexamethasone has shown a mortality benefit in hospitalized COVID-19 patients requiring oxygen with the greatest benefit in those who were ventilated or on ECMO. Additional antivirals, antibodies, immunomodulators, and cellular therapies are under study. I'd like to refer you to the NIH treatment guidelines. The web address is shown for you here. These are kept up to date. I'm proud to be one of the co-chairs of these, and uh, they are a wonderful resource to find the latest on treatment of COVID-19. And lastly, I'll just recognize my institution and a number of colleagues who helped with slides for this presentation. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Dr. Gulick, for that excellent talk. Just as a reminder, you can go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A. In fact, um, if we're short on time, it may be first come, first serve. So go ahead and good to get those in line. Um, also, as Dario did with his question, please indicate which speaker your question is for. So our next presenter is Dr. Andrew Owen. Dr. Owen is Professor of Molecular and Clinical Pharmacology at the University of Liverpool. And a major emphasis of Dr. Owen's research program in recent years has been using PKPD to accelerate oral and long-acting injectable nanomedicine candidates to clinical applications. He joins us today to share how his group has used pharmacology principles and modeling and simulation to select COVID-19 candidates. Dr. Owen? So it's a, it's a pleasure to be presenting virtually to the, the conference this year. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've been doing on the role of pharmacology in selection of COVID-19 candidates. Fair to say there are many more questions than answers at the moment, so that's very much going to be the theme um, of my presentation. So I'll start with just some, some of my disclosures. So it's clear that the lungs are a primary target organ for infection, for replication, and for the disease phenotype. But we do know that H2 is expressed in many other organs, including the kidneys, the gastrointestinal tract, the central nervous system. SARS-CoV-2 RNA can be detected in stool specimens of patients for protracted periods of time, in some cases even after the virus has been cleared from the lung. Um, the virus induces acute tubular damage in some patients. We also know about uh, 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 pa some patients exhibiting liver, liver comorbidities. So I guess the first question that we were addressing is are therapeutic drug concentrations within the systemic circulation and other organ, uh, affected organs going to be required for successful therapy and PEP? Um, when we start to think about chemo prevention, drugs may need to penetrate into other compartments uh, and they'll need to do this at sufficient concentrations to inhibit viral replication. And we started thinking through some of the issues around some novel PK compartments such as the mucous membranes present in the nasal cavity, in the oral, oral cavity, the throat, the surface of the eye, uh, tears, um, and the upper uh, respiratory tract and lungs. Another question of well reducing the inoculum size, even if we don't completely block transmission, 
provide uh, any benefits for morbidity and mortality. Um, and there's some evidence that higher SARS-CoV-2 RNA is indicative of a poor prognosis and some very weak actually evidence that uh, for other pulmonary viruses that the size of the inoculum to which the patient is uh, initially exposed um, uh, may, be, may be associated uh, with disease severity. Now there's been a number of calls for the application of clinical pharmacology principles to SARS-CoV-2 candidate selection and, and, and some of these are, are summarized here from the British Pharmacological Society as well as other major groups uh, and many of these are focused on candidate selection, others on the safety of the putative repurposing opportunities and then other work emerging, emerging on trying to understand the drug interactions um, uh, uh, for COVID-19. One of the things that we've been doing recently um, as part of an international group across the US um, and, and, and Europe is, is trying to better articulate some of the consensus that has been achieved for protein binding in other antiviral programs uh, which we've all worked on, such as HIV and HCV. I think it's fair to say that there's been an under-recognition of protein binding um, uh, in the early trials that were uh, conducted for SARS-CoV-2, but I think we're in the danger now of moving into an area uh, where there's over-interpretation of protein binding. I think it's very important to underscore, as we all know uh, from our work in, with other viruses, that the impact of protein binding requires an empirical determination and cannot just be assumed from the free drug fraction uh, in patients. Um, if we think about maybe some of the other principles of antiviral pharmacology that we can apply from uh, other viruses, well, we know that successful regimens have utilized drug combinations for HIV and for HCV, and, and that we usually target one or more mechanism within the uh, viral life cycle for maximal antiviral effect. Um, we, in other viruses, successful regimens have been developed on the basis that their plasma or target site concentrations are fully suppressive across the entire dosing interval. So we're more accustomed to thinking about C-TROF as a metric rather than C-MAX or, uh, or, or AUC. But it, it's important to recognize that the absence of empirically determined protein binding adjusted EC90 or EC95 values complicates our current interpretation of the existing anti-SARS-CoV-2 activity measurements. So one of the first things that we did back in um, uh, March and April was we looked at um, all of the antiviral, antiviral candidates that were out there and we tried to benchmark them on the basis of their plasma exposures in, in, in comparison to their, um, their in vitro activities. Um, now at the time there were um, uh, uh, 72 entries in the database with 57 derived EC90s. Unfortunately, most people are reporting EC50 and not EC90 or EC95 and derived EC90s where we could. And since for many of the drugs being investigated, they were not um, HIV drugs and the main pharmacokinetic parameters that have been reported are CMAX or AUC. Um, so we did an initial investigation of the CMAX to EC90 ratio where available. This database is currently being updated. We now have 430 entries with 134 derived EC90s. But we've taken a tiered approach to candidate selection where we looked at this crude analysis of the CMAX EC90 ratio, then moved into an assessment where available of the full PK profile relative to the in vitro activity, um, and where molecules were close to achieving um, those, uh, the, those predefined concentrations, we went back and applied modeling approaches to see if we could uh, simulate optimized doses or os optimized schedules which would maintain uh, our trough values above the EC90 targets. There's lots of caveats um, in this type of approach, uh, so please do read the limitations carefully in, in our published paper.
Now, one of the things which was obvious from this analysis is if you rank candidates purely on the basis of their in vitro activity, you get um, th this list of most potent um, molecules, including drugs we're familiar with, such as remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, some of the other four aminoquinolines. Um, but this actually tells us nothing about the pharmacokinetics from the approved dose of the drug. And of course, most of the repurposing opportunities which are being explored are directly repurposing the approved uh, uh, doses for SARS-CoV-2. Actually, when you look at the ranking in terms of the CMAX to the EC90 ratio, you get a very different list of drugs which appear to be at that point where the, the plasma concentrations for at least some of the, the, the profile exceed those concentrations which are needed for uh, activity against the virus in vitro. And just a couple on this list that I want to flag up because I'm going to talk about them in more detail is the remdesivir, uh, the nitazoxanide, um, as well as the clatasvir. So nitazoxanide was um, a molecule which we looked at um, uh, very early on back in April. Um, there's uh, quite a lot of preclinical in vitro data supporting this molecule now. Um, the initial report was by Wang back in 2020, but it's been confirmed by several groups, uh, including for the major circulating metabolite of this drug. Um, activity has also been reported um, uh, for the, uh, uh, by the um, manufacturer of the branded product in the US uh, against other viruses such as bovine canine and human enteric coronaviruses as well as influenza. The mechanism of action for SARS-CoV-2 has not been investigated, but for influenza, the drug appears to interfere with the N-glycosylation of the hemagglutinin of influenza. And it is interesting to note that SARS-CoV-2 spike protein is also heavily N-glycosylated, um, uh, is also a heavily N-glycosylated protein. There are several putative secondary mechanisms for action for this drug. It's been reported to amplify the host innate antiviral immune response for other viruses. And it's an antagonist of this ion channel in the lung, which may uh, result in bronchodilation uh, within some patients. There's actually some clinical supporting data uh, for nitazoxanide as well. Uh, single doses of this drug, up to four grams have been studied in humans without major, um, uh, uh, major uh, safety issues. It has excellent safety at its uh, uh, approved dose. It ranked very highly in our analysis of CMAX versus activity. Quite interestingly, back in 2014, a 600 milligram twice daily dose of this drug reduced the, du the, the duration of symptoms and virus burden in a placebo controlled phase 2b uh, 3 trial of uncomplicated uh, influenza. Now these weren't profound impacts on uh, influenza, but it did provide a signal um, that there, there, there may be for this um, a, a benefit for this drug uh, for another pulmonary virus. There's also some data uh, conducted um, uh, uh, over a decade ago for hepatitis C virus. Importantly though, um, we've done a, a lot of simulations with this drug, looking at the active metabolite, um, and um, those simulations indicate that the doses may not be uh, optimal for influenza or HCV. So I think there may be scope um, uh, for improving application of this drug through dose optimization. So just to illustrate that point, this simulation here shows the uh, pharmacokinetics of tizoxanide after administration of a 600 milligram BIV dose of nitazoxanide. Uh, and you can see the target concentration here set as the EC90 against influenza, and the drug barely creeps over at Cmax those concentrations required for in vitro activity against the strains of the influenza virus. 
we, we did some dose simulations for this drug against the SARS, the reported anti-SARS-CoV-2 EC90 values. And these predictions indicated that doses closer to 1,500 milligrams um, or 1,400 milligrams twice daily or 900 milligrams three times daily would provide concentrations in plasma above the in vitro EC90 um, in 90% of the simulated population across the entire dosing interval. And we're uh, currently in the process of trying to um, move this compound um, into a phase one, CMOS phase one, phase two A uh, trial um, in Liverpool and South Africa, looking at these higher doses uh, in the Agile platform trial. Now, there's been some recent interest in sofosbuvir and Declatasvir for SARS-CoV-2, and uh, this interest has come predominantly from several small trials which were conducted in Iran. Um, uh, th this is this is interesting research, but we have to be aware that many limitations of these trials, which include small numbers, uh, issues around randomization for some of the uh, work, uh, no placebo um, concomitant standard of care, we have a virin or boosted lapinavir, and no viral endpoint included um, in the trials. Um, but there is a signal of a benefit uh, from a meta-analysis now, the in vitro data for declatasvir currently come from a single source preprint. Now, uh, uh, it's, it's important to note that there are multiple reports for sofosfavir uh, in the literature, um, but the other reports demonstrate lower or no activity of this drug against SARS-CoV-2. Just to summarize the in vitro data, um, the declatasvir uh, um, uh, appears to have activity similar to that of chloroquine, um, and the sofosfavir uh, uh, appears to have um, uh, activities in the region of the lapinavir and ritonavir. Um, but uh, this group did demonstrate activity across a range of cell types, including the VO cells as well as hum human uh, uh, models, which are thought to be uh, more relative, uh, relevant. Now we've looked at the pharmacokinetics of sofosfavir, um, and um, this analysis does indicate that the, at the approved dose of 400 milligrams, neither the sofosfavir itself nor the major circulating metabolite, the dephosphorylated active uh, form of the um, of the sofosfavir, reach concentrations in the plasma where, which are anywhere near these concentrations which have shown to be uh, active in vitro. Um, so there may be some other mechanism at play there for, the, for this drug, but it doesn't seem very likely that this, this drug is going to reach target exposures required for viral suppression uh, uh, for SARS-CoV-2. We did look at declatasvir in much more uh, detail uh, than for sofosfavir. Um, uh, uh, declatasvir simulations uh, indicated that uh, target concentrations, trough target concentrations above those uh, concentrations needed to suppress the virus in vitro may be achievable, um, but this would require uh, markedly higher doses than, uh, than the approved dose. Um, and our simulations indicate to keep the population above this C trough target, you'd require doses closer to 330 milligrams three times a day um, uh, in order to hit this target. Of course, we don't understand the exposure response relationship for SARS-CoV-2, so, uh, so we, and I'm sure we've got a lot to learn about this uh, over the coming months and years. I did want to just say a little bit about remdesivir. I think it's interesting to compare uh, plasma exposure response across the proteid antiviral nucleosides. So I've just compared here uh, it, it, the, the indication for TAF in HIV, um, uh, sofosfavir in HCV, and then remdesivir and sofosfavir against SARS-CoV-2. Now, this type, this class of drug, 
is, is beneficial because it has a high penetration into the target cell. But we have to be mindful that the EC50 or the EC90 is an extracellular metric. It's not an intracellular metric. So it is, uh, it is correct to compare those EC50, EC90 values to the plasma concentration or the tissue concentration and not to the intracellular concentration. Um, because the intracellular active form is different to the value presented for the EC50 or EC90 value. Now, we know that in HIV for TAF, the prodrug exceeds those uh, EC50 values uh, 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 by orders of magnitude and is maintained for a short period. But, of course, this intracellular, high intracellular concentrations um, and this long intracellular half-life then maintain the activity across the do dosing interval beyond that. Similar for HCV with sofosfavir, um, you can see with remdesivir, you do it again exceed the uh, in vitro target concentrations early on, not to the same degree as you do with HIV and HCV, but again, uh, this demonstrates the point. And when we make that comparison with sofosfavir again, uh, the target concentrations do not exceed this extracellular metric of the of, of the EC50. So some other thoughts about antiviral uh, development that we've been looking at. This is a, a paper we've submitted recently, uh, chasing COVID-19 chemotherapeutics without putting in the cart before the horse. Um, I think it's important to recognize that a global pandemic requires a global solution um, and equitable access to the emergent medicines are going to be critical. Um, now, this requires thought during development about compatibility of the products with the global healthcare systems, um, which is also influenced, of course, by the use case, whether it's uh, prevention, whether it's post-exposure prophylaxis, or whether it's uh, direct treatment. And of course, when in treatment you deploy it, whether it's early in disease uh, or whether it's in late stage disease. Relying, I think, solely upon pre-existing formulations and pathologies uh, optimized for other diseases carries inherent risk. Um, we accept that um, advanced formulation development may um, uh, uh, take longer to implement than a direct repurposing, but I think it seems likely that this may improve our success rate in finding repurposing opportunities for COVID-19. I wouldn't be me if I didn't mention long-acting drug delivery, um, and we, uh, uh, we have been looking at opportunities. Clearly, you need effective drugs before you can think about compatibility with long-acting, but it, I think it is important um, to note the potential benefit of a long-acting dr drug delivery strategy as a bridge towards um, a, a vaccine. And uh, back in May this year, uh, results from the HPTN083 trial in HIV chemo prevention clearly demonstrated that long-acting calvitegravir was uh, 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 much more effective at prevention than, a, uh, than an oral uh, 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 prevention strategy. So I'll leave you with more questions than answers, as I promised I would do at the start of the talk. Um, and they were summarized here. Are therapeutic drug concentrations within the systemic circulation and other organs a prerequisite for successful therapy? Um, we're reducing inoculum size without, even in the absence of completely blocking transmission, provide benefits for morbidity and mortality. Do we have time to wait for steady state pharmacokinetics to achieve? So, so for HIV, we accepted in some cases one to two weeks uh, to reach steady state. But in SARS-CoV-2, that's, that's really going to be too late because the, the antiviral really need to be starting to work on day one of therapy. Are drug combinations going to be a prerequisite for success? Should we be thinking now about potential future issues with drug resistance as we consider this emergency development phase for therapeutics that we're going through? Are the current methods for viral 
quantification fit for purpose? And can we even use them to define minimum effective concentrations in patients once we do have more successful um, uh, 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 drugs coming through the development plans? So I leave you with some acknowledgements. I do want to acknowledge my, my team in Liverpool that have been working almost 24 hours a day for the last six months. Joe Sharp, Megan Leary and Helen Box who have uh, been working around the clock to establish SARS-CoV-2 animal infection models, which we're, current, we're starting to do our first work in now. Um, uh, uh, Paul Curley, Lee, Tita, Musman, Arshad uh, and, uh, and Anthony for working around the clock on in vitro DMPK for some of these targets, as well as optimizing innumerable bioanalytical assays to underpin our, uh, our preclinical po portfolio. Um, uh, Rajit Rajoli and Henry Pertness, who have, who have done an, an enormous amount of pharmacometrics uh, work over the last six months. Thank you very much, Dr. Owen, for that thought-provoking talk. Our next speaker is Dr. Kimberly Struble. Dr. Struble is medical team leader in the Division of Antiviral Products at the Food and Drug Administration. In this role, she leads the team responsible for the development of new products for the treatment and prevention of HIV, hepatitis B and C, influenza, various herpes infections, and other emerging viral infections. Dr. Struble has been involved in all phases of clinical drug development during her more than 25-year career at the, NIA, at the FDA. Sorry. Uh, Dr. Struble's presentation is titled FDA Perspectives on COVID-19 Drug Development. Dr. Struble. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. Although I always enjoy talking about long-acting antiretrovirals at this meeting, it's nice to change topics and provide FDA's perspective on COVID-19 drug development. I have no financial disclosures. So today I'll discuss the pathways for COVID-19 drug development with an emphasis on the role of clinical pharmacology for repositioned or repurposed drugs. In the literature and media, repositioned or repurposed drugs are either approved drugs for another indication and are now being evaluated for COVID-19, or they're investigational drugs under development for another indication. In this case, some existing data from early trials regarding safety can support the use in various COVID populations. I will also briefly uh, talk about considerations for monoclonal antibody development and design and safety considerations for COVID-19 clinical trials. For a new molecular entity, or NME, the traditional drug development pathway begins with discovery, non-clinical testing and research, which can take three to six years. And this is followed by clinical research and development, which takes another two to 10 years all by post-marketing surveillance. So during a pandemic for a new disease, the pathway to drug development may look different. They're often accelerated, and some phases of clinical research are combined versus having separate phase one, phase two, and phase three drug development with traditional uh, drug development timelines. So here are some possible timelines for COVID drug development. A short-term development timeline may be months for repositioned or repurposed approved drugs for investigational drugs and development for another indication. Examples of this is remdesivir, which was originally developed for Ebola, or an IL-6 inhibitor, tocilizumab, which is approved for rheumatoid arthritis. Midterm drug development timelines could be for vaccines, which can take months to years to develop. And for longer term development uh, timelines could take years for the discovery of a new mechanism action or novel drug. However, in the advent of monoclonal antibodies for COVID-19, um, development, these novel products are currently being recruited in the U.S. and other countries in clinical trials. So they took several months to develop instead of, new, instead of several years to discover um, a, a new novel drug. Before I go into more specifics, it's important to note the rapid pace of drug development for COVID-19. When this data became available in May of, of this year by the FDA, we had over 570 programs that were in the planning stages for therapeutics, and over 270 trials were being reviewed by FDA. And these numbers continue to rise um, from May through September. This slide shows the various potential COVID therapeutics being evaluated and their potential role. These agents are reviewed in multiple different review divisions at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. For example, some IL-6 inhibitors are reviewed in rheumatology, 
and other product, products are reviewed in pulmonary, oncology, and cardiorenal. My comments today will focus on small molecules and monoclonal antibodies whose mechanism of action is an antiviral. I'd also like to point out that convalescent plasma is reviewed in the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research and will not be discussed today in this talk. So given the rapid pace of drug development, it's important to strategize and prioritize the goals of research to ensure safe and effective products are brought to the public in an expedited manner. One goal is to get the right drug at the right dose to the right person at the right stage of disease. To move forward with a drug development program that may combine phases of drug development, it's important to first have pharmacologic plausibility, meaning to have data to suggest a reasonable mechanism of action or in vitro activity to support the prospect of use or animal model data if available to suggest activity. Additionally, a sound rationale is needed. And then you can move into uh, clinical trials to evaluate proof of concept, safety, and then maybe additional dose finding trials are needed before moving into phase two and three combined trials. And I'll talk more about those uh, shortly. But a key factor in all this is the importance of incorporating PK and PD assessment throughout the development. Now, focusing on the initial development for repositioned or repurposed drugs, and because phases of drug development may often be combined in this phase, initial dose selection is sometimes based on the already approved drug, or for investigational agents, the dose or doses that are currently being evaluated in other indications. And it's important to note that these may not be specific for COVID with respect to exposures needed for activity. However, the aspects of COVID-19 could complicate the exposure and dose assessment. Specifically, how does the cytokine storm, organ failure, comorbidities such as obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, how could these affect PK and dosing? We need reliable PK and PD uh, data to build models to help address gaps in knowledge such as dosing in subpopulations and drug interactions. Without PK assessment, we do lose the ability to characterize important exposure response relationships and to be in the ability to discern what exposures matter. We acknowledge the concerns about PK collection due to infection control issues, especially in an outpatient setting. But again, these data are important and critical for the overall evaluation. For the reposition and repurpose drugs, it's important to note that the PK models developed for these other disease areas may not be applicable to COVID, especially for the more severe disease, such as patients in the ICU. We need to develop pop population PK and other PKPD models that incorporate data from different sources, such as ICU and dialysis patients. Also, reliable PD data to understand exposure response at the site of infection relative to an EC50 or 90 is also important. However, there are challenges with these PD markers um, because of the variability in viral load in the upper and lower respiratory tract and how to reliably assess the relationship between viral load and clinical endpoints is still unknown. Another key factor is drug-drug interactions. And PK is important to determine what exposures are important for these drug interactions and what could potentially be some dose adjustment if needed. It's not possible to have all the drug interactions addressed prior to approval for COVID products. And this isn't even possible in traditional drug development for other diseases such as HIV. We need to be more proactive and leverage what we know about the SIP and transporter uh, pathways about a product and potentially utilize PDPK modeling to help provide recommendations. Something unique about COVID treatment is the treatment is generally less than two weeks of dosing versus chronically administered drugs like HIV. And, the, and, can, get, and can one get away without providing the predominant medication during this time? Or could staggering dosing help overcome the drug interaction? Now moving to monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies are being developed to specifically target COVID-19 and are therefore new molecular entities with a new mechanism of action. These products are quickly entering into platform trials in which I'll discuss in the next slides. Before a monoclonal antibody can be studied in humans, prerequisite animal data are needed. And it depends on the patient population that's being studied, like how much data are needed before a trial is initiated or how much data um, it needs to be available in parallel with the ongoing trial. These data help us balance potential safety issues such as antibody-dependent enhancement, which could exacerbate disease. Now, these are important to know that these are general recommendations to allow for expedited movement into the clinic 
typically we have this data and we don't allow data to be in progress before our trial initiation and other disease areas. For hospitalized patients with moderate, severe, or critical disease, uh, what we're asking for now is single dose pharmacokinetic and toxicokinetic data, safety information, and the relevant species. At the time of the first trial, the repeat dose toxicity studies in animals and the tissue cross reactivity data need to be in progress but submitted before phase two. Now, tissue cross reactivity data identifies the specific and non specific binding of antibodies or antibody like proteins in various human or non human tissues. And it's really the staining pattern and distribution of the staining on the panel of human tissues that helps alert us to potential toxicity uh, towards certain organs. In a non-hospitalized uh, setting with patients with mild disease, the single-dose PK, toxicokinetic, animal safety, and tissue cross reactivity data are needed. The repeat dose toxicity data in animals would be ongoing and submitted before phase two. For healthy volunteers, including uh, prevention trials, the tissue cross reactivity and the repeat dose toxicity animal data are needed. So as you can see, the less sick the population, the more data is needed prior to initiating trials. Also, another consideration is that in phase one, you can consider studying safety and PK in patients rather than healthy volunteers. In 2017, FDA published in the New England Journal of Medicine this review article about master protocols, which are being used more often today for diseases outside of oncology. This slide shows the innovative trial design and an overview of master protocols, which are intended to simultaneously evaluate more than one investigational agent in parallel under a single protocol within the same overall trial infrastructure without a need to develop new products for every trial. Multiple intervention specific substudies or trials share key design components and operational aspects. This promotes efficient and expedited late stage drug development. And each specific intervention substudy or trial contains all the elements specific to the interventions being studied, and these trials can run concurrently. So there are several types of master protocols. The umbrella study, the umbrella trial studies multiple targeted therapies in the context of a single disease. And a basket trial evaluates a single targeted therapy in the context of multiple diseases or disease subtypes, and this is often done in oncology. For a platform trial, which studies multiple targeted therapies in the context of a single disease in a professional manner, the therapy is allowed to enter or leave the platform on the basis of a decision algorithm, and this is like adaptive, adaptive uh, trial design. The Prevail 2 and Palm trials for Ebola were designed with the ability to evaluate multiple investigational therapies at once, and there are several ongoing master protocols for Active one uh, trial is evaluating immune modulators for moderate to severe disease. Active two is an outpatient study evaluating monoclonal antibodies and other therapies. Active three is an inpatient study looking at monoclonal antibodies and other therapies. So there are real advantages to master protocols, such as sharing a common control arm, and is an efficient way to evaluate multiple products concurrently. And also the uh, standard of care can change as needed if newer products are found to be safe and effective. Now thinking about safety consideration for accelerated development programs, especially for first in human trials. The protocol should have various risk mitigation strategies, such as uh, having stringent enrollment criteria. You may start with a small number of subjects or sentinel cohort before uh, dosing group. Also to ensure at-risk healthy volunteers or domicile for assessment of local and systemic reactions. You can stagger dosing between patients for specified intervals. Also it would be important to have enrollment pauses while the data monitoring committee reviews the safety before large numbers of patients are exposed. And this is especially important when rapid um, enrollment is expected. Also including stringent stopping rules for individual subjects, for the cohorts and the study as a whole and also having a data monitoring committee and independent statistician to monitor for safety. In the case of monoclonal antibody development, also be able to assess if the rate of disease is higher in the monoclonal antibody treatment arm compared to standard of care. So in conclusion, drug development in a pandemic is accelerated, but should not compromise the rigorous evaluation of safety and efficacy in randomized controlled trials. We can work together to move efficiently through phases of development and the use of master 
uh, and platform trials as an important example. Although I didn't specifically mention this, um, but I'd like to point out that the FDA does encourage the inclusion of a diverse population in all phases of development. And this inclusion helps to ensure that medical products are safe and effective for everyone. We strongly encourage the enrollment of populations that are most affected by COVID-19, specifically racial and ethnic minorities, and also encouraging enrolling pregnant and lactating individuals, provided that the um, non-clinical information is available and favorable, and also enrolling um, pediatric patients. Also want to stress the importance of these PK and PD assessments to utilize when appropriate modeling to help fill the knowledge gaps in dose selection, especially for dosing in certain sub subgroups and drug-drug interactions. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge Vikram Arya, who helped provide the inspiration for this talk. Um, when I was first asked, it was a little daunting um, because of the, a diverse range of topics that people wanted to hear FDA's perspective on, um, some of which are not all covered in our division, and I appreciate the input that he provided for this. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Struble, for that terrific talk. So we will now move into the discussion portion of this session. Um, please type any questions that you have in the Q&A if you haven't already. And Dr. Scarzi and I will then pose your questions to the speakers. We're going to try to use um, start with the oldest and those that have the most number of votes and spread it across um, speakers. And we are hoping that this will be interactive. OK, I think the first question that came through was for Dr. Gulick. And this question was, um, you know, which, what are the potential explanations uh, for the failure of remdesivir in patients on ECMO? Uh, were there differences in the PK of the drugs? Was that tested? So I think the most likely reason that remdesivir does not show the same level of activity at people who are sicker may well be that the cytokine storm is in full course. And we know from other uh, respiratory virus illnesses like influenza that antivirals are most effective if you treat early in the disease rather than later in the disease. Uh, to directly answer the question, I'm not aware that they did pharmacokinetics in people who are ventilated or on ECMO. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Scarzi, do you want to pose the next question? Yeah, so I'm going to go now to the full panel. Um, the question that has the most uh, votes right now is um, from Dr. Anderson. So for the panel, is there a change in COVID virulence? It seemed like in March and April, we had a much higher rate of hospitalization and mortality compared with the recent summer and fall spikes that we've been seeing. And so for the panel, do we think that this is the case? Um, and if so, what may, the, what may be the explanation? I think Dr. Gulick is probably, uh, I'll turn to you first, as what you're seeing in, in New York City. Well, I'm happy to jump in. I, I think there may be multiple factors here. If you look virologically, uh, SARS-CoV-2 does not have a propensity to mutate. Um, so looking at circulating strains around the globe, the differences among them in terms of genetic changes are small. There is more recent data to suggest that there could be factors that lead to um, enhanced transmission in the community. Of course, that would be the opposite of what you just asked as to why anecdotally people seem to be doing better. Um, I'll say from a clinical point of view, we've learned about COVID over time. And some of the drugs that or prospective drugs that I reviewed today definitely have shown clinical benefits. So remdesivir and dexamethasone and I think clinicians are probably better at taking care of people with COVID than they were at the beginning of the epidemic. So I suspect there are probably multiple reasons why that may be true. Another really important one is that epidemiologically, younger people are now being infected more commonly than older people. Or I should turn that around and say, cases of SARS-CoV-2 are being seen more frequently in younger people. And we know from, uh, a clinical point of view that younger people do better with this illness than older people. So I suspect there's a, a variety of factors that are coming into play. Thank you. 
Okay, our next question was for Dr. Lamour. Um, you mentioned planned or ongoing drug-drug interaction studies with remdesivir and antiretroviral therapy. Um, regarding your approach, does it include both plasma and intracellular measurements? So for DDI evaluation, do you think there's value uh, in studying both? Thank you very much. I when we designed those studies, actually, we weren't really thinking about COVID. We were thinking about Ebola, Marburg, other strains in Ebola, apart from Ebola, Zaire, actually. Um, and we know we have about a million people on antiretroviral therapy. So at the time the studies were designed, there was very little data, even in plasma, about remdesivir um, in African populations. So we're interested in plasma as well. But our primary endpoint is really looking at intracellular uh, PK of the phosphorylated metabolites of tenofovir and remdesivir. Uh, we're doing it in a very small study of about 24 uh, subjects. Um, 16 of them do a crossover, and then eight of them have tenofovir 3 tc and atazanavir as well, and it's more of a single arm study. Um, so that's the approach we have. Thanks so much, Mohammed. I'm, I'm curious if the other panelists would like to weigh in on, on the approach to drug-drug interaction studies. I know, um, Dr. Strubel, you, you touched on it. And, um, you know, Dr. Owen, you've done a lot in this area. So um, I'm just curious if you have anything you'd like to add into um, what we should be thinking about as a pharmacology community in trying to answer some of these questions. I can, I can start. I think one of the things, the important thing is, is to prioritize some of these drug interactions that are going to be commonly used in, um, in this patient population based on what we know about the metabolic pathway. Because I think some of these drug interactions um, kind of fall later in development. And it's um, you know, a little bit more challenging when you have acutely ill patients that are hospitalized that you need to um, have that information sooner than later. So I would like to encourage more attention paid to you know, conducting some of these drug interaction studies. I recognize that it's like very challenging because uh, the rapid pace of drug development that we're seeing today, um, you know, and the length of time it does take to do a drug interaction, you know, kind of how to um, merge those timelines together. I I agree, Kim, with everything that's been said. One of one of the things that we have been trying to do is see if there's any beneficial <laughs> drug interactions as well. Um, so, you know, trying to learn from the return of the boosting of the PIs. Um, one of them, I mean, we haven't come across anything successful or that looks positive yet, but one, one example that we looked at was with the tizoxamide metabolite of um, uh, nitazoxamide. It's actually cleared by glucuron adhesion. So we did do some metrics around whether we could block that clearance mechanism using a drug like atazanavir, for example. But the, um, the magnitude of the interaction in the cases we've looked at hasn't really indicated that there would be a benefit. Okay, um, next question for Dr. Gulick and Owen. In the DISCOVER study, they're testing sofosbuvir decladosphere on top of the country-specific treatment regimen. Given available evidence that lopinavir, ritonavir, and hydroxychloroquine do not work, likely because they cannot achieve high enough concentrations in target tissues without compromising patient safety with the markedly higher dosing required, why are these therapies being studied in conjunction with SOFTAC? Is adding on drugs to therapies with poor data supporting their use really the best strategy moving forward? I'm happy to jump in on that. <laughs> I think um, I think the design of international studies in general respects the local standard of care, and there may be quite a few local standards of care out there uh, around the world. Um, data are getting out about the drugs that you mentioned, lopinavir, ritonavir, with its PK challenges, um, hydroxychloroquine with its efficacy challenges. Uh, yet, we still have to respect that local places may have their own standards of care. So I think it's uh, a reasonable thing to say we're going to test this new therapy on top of what's being done. So standard of care plus minus the new therapy is a pretty accepted way to do it. Andrew, you may have other thoughts about that. 
No, I, I, I agree, Tripp. I, I think it's just that issue with standard of care. And there's a question there about whether you can trial medicine without using the standard of care in parallel. Actually, the the, uh, the use of uh, Calitra in Iran prompted us to look at um, whether the co-administration of lopinavir and ritonavir might boost the declatasvir because of the shared metabolic um, uh, processes, but um, again, the, the interaction between the two didn't provide an indication of that much of a boosting of um, uh, of declatasvir to overcome the deficit in the uh, plasma exposure to the in vitro activity. But I, I agree, it's just an issue of having to use standard of care locally. Okay, um, so the next question we have up is um, for Dr. Bulick again. Uh, so considering the conflicting data on so many non-randomized studies, could you offer some um, thoughts on the best strategy to rationalize the design of these studies? And I think many of our panelists probably have, have ideas on this one, but I'll, I'll start with Dr. Bulick. Sure, I, I think we need to uh, be respectful of the history of drug development, but at the same time realize that we have a pandemic and people were desperate to try things. So being in New York, which, uh, you know, we had the original tidal wave of cases here in the United States, we looked at what was happening in China and Europe and, and kind of felt like we needed to try things. And the rest of the world really did the same. So we tried things that were on hand, available. Uh, the original reports were case reports, case series. And then as more people began to try things, we had retrospective cohort studies. But we know from clinical trials that those often lead to biased results. And when you have non-randomized therapies, there are confounders. And either the sickest patients get the therapy or the healthiest patients get the therapy. And it reinforces the principle that we need prospective randomized clinical trials to really show us what works. And our field, I mean, COVID's only, what, six months old here in the United States? And uh, we've already seen a tremendous amount of drug development. So we have identified some drugs that work through randomized clinical trials, and we have discarded some that we used very commonly. So it gives me faith, I think, in the drug development process and reinforces the principle that the, the only way we can make rational decisions about treatment is prospective randomized clinical trials. I'm sure Kim Struble will disagree with that. <laughs> well, let's kind of keep with that topic. So Linda Lewis asked a question for the panel. You know, platform trials seem to be a good mechanism for repurposed drugs. How do we get new products in early development into platform trials that will evaluate multiple products um, at the same time. This seemed to be the mechanism for evaluating Ebola products, but hasn't been used, it seems, for COVID. Well, actually, the active trials are um, evaluating monoclonal antibodies. So the, these newer investigational drugs are being um, put into this platform trials. The uh, AIDS Clinical Trials Group here in the U.S. Yeah. Is sponsoring one of the active trials with a series of monoclonal antibodies and other investigational compounds. So uh, I agree with Kim that platform studies may be actually just the right way to test more than one investigational treatment as they become available. All right, I'm gonna turn the next question uh, to Dr. Owen. Um, can you elaborate on the protein binding effects and how those should be accounted for when determining the effective dosing for COVID um, or for antiviral drugs in general? The uh, put my put my neck in the protein binding noose. You mean? <laughs> you did. <laughs> um, so yeah. So uh, I mean, I think we all recognise that protein binding, considering protein binding is uh, critical because. It's assumed that it's only the free fraction that can is free to exert the antiviral effect. Um, 
and uh, the the early trials certainly or the early candidate selection for SARS-CoV-2 didn't take protein binding into consideration at all. Um, but as we move to the the next phase now of, of candidate selection, I think we've got to be mindful that we we can't just we can't just correct the free drug concentration in plasma and compare that to the uh, in vitro antiviral activity um, for several reasons, but uh, most importantly because there's protein included in the in vitro studies when the EC50 is generated, so the free drug concentration in the in vitro study isn't zero. Um, uh, there, was, there were studies done over two decades ago now, which um, showed that for lipinavir, for example, just 5% um, uh, bovine serum in the culture media was able to buy 94, 93, 94% of the lipinavir. Um, so if we if we correct based on a 99%, we should be correcting to the 94% and not to zero. Um, so uh, the way we've approached this uh, for HIV and and uh, other viruses is to conduct the uh, you know empirically determine the protein binding adjusted EC50, but that has to be done experimentally. It can't just be um, or we could or we could measure the free drug concentration in the in vitro assay. But if we want to take account of it properly, I think we need to uh, consider that better. Okay, um, I'll take a question here from uh, Paul Domenico. Uh, Dr. Gulick, thoughts on progress to modulate the Brady Kynan storm? So this is a, a newer area that's been identified um, is whether the so-called bradykinin storm could explain some of the end organ damage and the complications we see in COVID, um, either in parallel to or exclusive from the cytokine storm. And uh, I, I don't know that anybody's targeting this yet. This has really just come out in recent weeks that this could be another plausible way that COVID uh, wreaks, wreaks uh, damage. Um, so if it turns out to be substantiated, obviously it's a target for potential uh, interruption with drug therapies. All right. Um, so our next question here, it looks like it's uh, from Dr. Uh, it's for Dr. Gulick and everyone. Um, do we have any idea on the influence of severe inflammation on the PK of remdesivir in convalescent plasma? Um, Jose wonders if this may explain the lack of and conflicting results in advanced disease. And I noticed, um, Dr. Strubel, in your talk, you, you mentioned kind of the importance of uh, building PDPK models around um, critically ill patients. And so maybe this is a topic area that you could jump in on as well. Kim, you want to start? No, oh, you can go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm, I was just going to reiterate that I think when you're using an antiviral in this illness, you want to use it early. And uh, whether it's the inflammation or just the fact that once you get the cytokine storm revved up, that uh, the cat's out of the bag in terms of the virus a bit. And, uh, and that's when we begin to focus on immunomodulation. Um, the dexamethasone data is so impressive. Um, and then people are trying to parse the cytokine storm, or as we heard, the bradykinin storm, um, into pieces to try to, to affect or inhibit or, or change those responses. But uh, I think probably all of that is relevant. I know less about the effects of inflammation on altering the PK. I'd be interested to hear from my fellow panelists about that. Uh, so there are um, a number of, I mean, I, I, it doesn't relate to remdesivir, but it's obviously a lot of literature emerged on the impact of, uh, um, of COVID-19 on lipinavir pharmacokinetics, um, which seems to be somewhere between two to four fold higher in COVID-19 than it is in, uh, he, in during HIV infection. So I think we've got a lot to understand about that. I'm not sure we know the mechanism. 
Right, and I think also some of these things could be different for our small molecules, which are antivirals versus uh, monoclonal antibodies. And how do we you know, factor that information in as well? And what you know, information about inflammation can we leverage from other therapeutic areas uh, to, to help with some of these models? And I think it's just so challenging that this is, you know, moving so rapidly that you usually have a little bit of time in early drug development to you know, work some of these issues out, but these are being done not even in parallel because sometimes things are happening faster in the clinic in terms of getting information on safety and efficacy than working on these very important issues to help build these PKPD models. It seems like capturing inflammation um, measures as well as you know, frequent measures of organ function are gonna be important for um, looking at those as potential explanations for PK variability. Is there any guidance for exactly what those inflammatory markers, the most useful ones might be for these trials? I think we're still learning mm -hmm. about this. People have uh, nominated a whole series of markers and some of these have been linked to clinical outcomes like D-dimer, for instance. Um, but there are a whole host of things you can measure. I think one of the biggest challenges is we say the word cytokine storm, but that really can be many, many, many different cytokines um, and, and other reactants that are coming into play. I, I'm not sure we know enough about which ones to measure that could be important for clinical care, much less for the PK implications. It's really a challenge, I think. Okay, um, I had a question for, for Dr. Lamord. He mentioned that a significant need, there was a significant need to conduct studies with WHO priority pathogens. Um, but what are the greatest barriers to conducting those studies? Is it lack of therapeutic agents to study? Are there uh, infrastructure issues with conducting clinical research in the regions where we need to do the study? Or, or what, what are the, the biggest challenges? Jennifer, I think that's an excellent question, and it's the combination. I think you need to have research teams in the locations where these outbreaks would occur. And those research teams need to be trained on an ongoing basis. If you really want to do these studies during outbreaks, um, I think that's one of the most challenging types of um, research endeavors one can take on. Um, the issues with the research during, child, uh, during outbreaks is that you have this situation where the regulators and the government need to agree on an approach. And often at the time the investigator is putting all the protocol, um, you know, either the government has not made a decision or the regulator is not really confident about the data that they already have. Um, what we've learned from Uganda is that it makes sense to plan ahead preposition protocols, preposition teams have that research standby effort to be just a fraction of their, uh, of their, of their daily job. So they maybe do 20% for research preparedness, or maybe 80% they do on ongoing sepsis work. And then you can rapidly bring up the teams when you have the opportunity to do the research. Um, but engaging with the stakeholders, um, outbreak um, government, um, um, officials and regulators it's often years in, years in advance is really the only way that you know we see this happening uh, in a smooth manner thank you hey, i'm uh, glad to see a couple uh, discussion comments coming in from the audience so i'll just summarize um, two from dr castillo mencia um, he mentions that uh, C-reactive protein, pro C-reactive protein, and the procalcitonin ferritin ratio have been associated with risk of intubation and mortality. Um, so perhaps that's one place to uh, start with um, our prior conversation. And then he also poses, um, I think, an interesting discussion point that now that the the vaccine studies are underway, it'll be interesting to assess the efficacy of remdesivir and other drugs in patients who receive the vaccine versus placebo, um, sort of as a, a build on from Dr. Anderson's question. So does anyone want to comment on how we're going to approach these um, antiviral studies in combination with the vaccine studies? I think that would be somewhat similar to what we do with influenza trials. I mean, we look at the efficacy, those who had prior vaccination versus those who do not. Do not. 
and also to take a close look to see if there would be any vaccine interference um, information that would be useful to leverage um, before embarking on those studies as well. Um, for Dr. Gulick, what are your thoughts that TAF um, or TDF might prevent COVID infection as some studies suggest? So this is interesting. <laughs> um, as we know, uh, tenofovir is uh, an adenosine uh, analog. Um, remdesivir is an adenosine analog as well. So that, that's interesting structurally. Um, the Spaniards, I think, were the first to look at what was going on in their people living with HIV community. And they reported on several hundred people, um, some of whom had developed COVID. And then they attempted to associate what antiretrovirals they were taking for their HIV disease and what was the clinical outcome with COVID. And somewhat surprisingly, they found that people who were on TDF had over 50% reduction in some of the complications of COVID. So at face value, you might say, hmm, does uh, TDF have a preventative effect on COVID? But again, this was not a prospective clinical trial, but rather a descriptive uh, cohort study. And it makes you think about confounders. So the big question is, well, why were those people on TDF? And was this a group who perhaps were younger without evidence of complicating illnesses that would have made you avoid TDF like renal failure or cardiovascular disease or other things? Or more simply put, was it a younger group that was still taking TDF as opposed to TAF or some of the other alternatives? And might that explain the COVID outcomes? But Nevertheless, that was kind of interesting to see. Uh, another study from the Western Cape in South Africa uh, looked at all people living in the Western Cape and came up with the same association, that people with TDF were statistically significantly less likely to have complications from COVID. But again, TDF is first-line therapy in South Africa. So if you're not on it, chances are it's because you have some kind of a complication. So it might be the same confounder operating there as well. The Spaniards, though, took it to the next level and said, we're going to do a prospective randomized study of TDF for the prevention of COVID. And that study's in progress right now. I, we looked at that on the guidelines and recommended that people not change their antiretroviral drugs to try to uh, prevent COVID, uh, that the, the information is not solid enough really to provoke changes in therapies among stable patients. But it's provocative. Great, uh, so our next question is for Dr. Owen. Um, how important are plasma concentrations in determining the best drug candidate? Um, and you, I know you mentioned lung concentrations and, and other tissue concentrations. So have those been able to be taken into account in your simulations that you presented? Can I, can I just say, I don't know and leave it at that, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, is, this is an interesting one. So in our original analysis of the candidates that we published in CPT back in April, um, we did actually integrate um, a well-known pharmacometric equation in order to estimate the lung penetration as well. And we benchmarked candidates on the basis of their, uh, their expected lung accumulation. Um, now, those, those equations are quite robust. They, re they, 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 they rely on physiochem, the molecule, and the composition of the tissue in order to estimate the accumulation. So they don't tell you about where within the tissue the drug is. So, you know, that could be important. It, it, a, a, a lot of drugs are estimated to accumulate in the lung because of lysosomal trapping. Um, and theref therefore, the, the concentration might be high because the drug is all trapped in the lysosomes. Um, so so, so we, can't, we don't have good equations to try and work out whether it's in the epithelium or, you know, where in the tissue it is. Um, but the, 
I kind of moved away from that over the last couple of months. And, uh, and probably the main reason for that was that the four amino quinolines, the drugs like chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, they were predicted and actually do accumulate to a huge degree in the lung, um, a, a hundredfold, you know, uh, two, three hundredfold accumulation in lung tissue compared to plasma. And yet they still don't work. Um, now, you know, as well as that, um, we've got, um, um, you know, we've got em data emerging all the time about ongoing viral replication in other tissues. So, whereas the disease phenotype is restricted, you, know, you know, predominantly within the within the lung, I'm not sure that just hitting the virus in the lung is going to be sufficient. But I don't know. <laughs> Dr. Sturwell, can you offer any perspective from the FDA of what 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 you guys are you talked about um, kind of what we we need what drug candidates need going forward with the FDA? But is there things that we need to think about as a pharmacology community to make sure that we're providing you know is plasma enough? Are there other things that we need to really focus on to help answer some of what Dr. Owen highlighted? Right, I agree with Dr. everything Dr. Owen had uh, said as well. I think it's really important to kind of incorporate you know, the valuation of PK and PD, you know, early into these trials as well. And and um, when we're talking about collecting information on other investigational uh, parameters, that's important too to do early in, in development as, as well. Um, as I said, it's you know these trials are happening so rapidly that it's very challenging to kind of keep up with the pace. It's not that we have to evaluate PK in real time during these trials, but just making sure that we collect samples where we can go back and do some of these evaluations, particularly if we have concerns about dosing um, or our safety toxicity that, you know, we're still moving forward. So having some of those information would be helpful. I'm going to ask um, Kim's question of Dr. Lamord. How have emerging infections impacted care programs for other chronic and infectious conditions in your setting? How can we help to ensure that progress is not significantly hindered by COVID or other emerging infections? I think that's the biggest concern right now um, for countries that have used rather aggressive public health measures to keep the number of cases of COVID low. Um, we've also seen a rise in um, non-COVID related mortality, um, maternal mortality, uh, decline in immunization coverage. Um, and the key thing here is ensuring continuity of care. Uganda set up actually a separate pillar just to look at continuity of care. Um, and um, what we see as the main disruptors are um, healthcare worker infections. And so really narrowing down to protect healthcare workers, supporting infection control in healthcare facilities, avoiding healthcare worker deaths. Um, these are the things that keep health facilities open and uh, services going on. Uh, so the approach we use is an ongoing mentorship program that continues to visit the facilities and strengthen gaps uh, and close gaps that are identified. Um, and we think that that is one of the most important strategies that can be used in, in developing countries. All right. Um, uh, Dr. Bullock, I'm going to uh, pose a question from Jules Levin. Um, so the question is around kind of uncertainty about whether or not HIV is a, a risk factor for COVID. Um, some studies suggest that it's not a risk for infection, um, uh, but that may be confusing because many uh, people living with HIV may have many comorbidities that, that result in, in greater risk. Um, so do you have any comments for the community on, on how they should, and, and treating physicians on, on how we should view the risk for COVID in patients living with HIV? Sure, there are a lot of descriptive data about people with HIV um, and what happens with COVID. And from much of the world, there does not seem to be an independent risk conferred by HIV itself. Um, Jules is right to point out that people living with HIV, particularly in 2020, may be older, which is a risk factor, or may have comorbidities, 
uh, such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And we know those are risk factors for the development of more severe COVID. The one exception in terms of HIV cohort studies the world over, again, is the Western Cape. And they published their data that HIV seemed to be an independent risk factor, regardless of people taking antiretroviral therapy. Um, for, so there was a risk factor for an increased risk of mortality from COVID. Uh, but again, that has not been seen in, the, in Europe or the United States. So I think we need to, to learn more, but almost surprisingly, HIV did not seem to be an independent risk factor. Okay, a question about use of Vero cells. So these are uh, kidney cells, African green monkey. Um, could use of these cells explain why some promising in vitro candidates didn't translate um, when used in clinical studies? I, I can take that, Jen. Um, it's, um, it, it is, um, it's, it's a cell line that is, uh, has been in culture, I think, since the 60s or the 70s. The, my, my, my in vitro team tell me they're like leather, is the way they uh, describe them. So they, 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 they're not an ideal model, I don't think. And I think that is borne out in the recent literature. And there's several groups uh, establishing uh, culturable cell lines, which, which are human cell derived, such as the Kalu 3s and um, uh, and even HUH7 hepatic cell lines. There's also a lot of work um, being done on uh, organoid models and lung epithelial uh, cell lines, which may provide better models. Um, I think the, the one of the, the big examples, I guess, um, was a paper published a few months ago, which showed that um, hydroxychloroquine, I think, had activity in the viral cells, but it didn't have activity in viral cells which were overexpressing Temporus 2, which is an auxiliary protein. So the, there are viral cells transfected with Temporus 2 as well, which may be uh, more applicable, but I think we've still got a lot to learn about what the ideal models are for our vitro studies. Okay, well, thank you all so much for a great discussion session. We're now gonna close session one and move into our virtual coffee break. So um, take a moment to familiarize yourself with On Air, but there's a meeting hub there and that's a good place to connect with your colleagues. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.